In the last video, we had discussed an equation for the sine wave which repeated every second. Before we go ahead and describe an equation for a more generic waveform, we'll build up to it by looking at the properties of this wave. What makes this wave distinctly unique? Firstly, we have the amplitude. It's the maximum height a wave can take, measured from the x-axis. Of course, a wave can be shifted and unbalanced in the real world, and in this case, we measure the amplitude from the wave's natural resting position, or by taking an average of all the values of the wave. The wave equation can be multiplied with any scalar value to scale up or scale down the amplitude of the wave. Let's call it A. In audio, the loudness of an audio signal is determined by the amplitude of the wave. We'll talk about exactly what loudness is in another module, but thinking about it holistically, as we decrease the amplitude, we decrease the loudness of the wave till it becomes almost inaudible. In digital signals, we cap how much amplitude a wave can take on. The digital maximum is 1, and the digital minimum is negative 1. What happens if you boost your amplitude higher than that? In digital systems, and I stress that it's only in digital systems like in computers and digital audio hardware that this happens, the signal gets constrained to one. We get all sorts of nasty artifacts when the signal is played back. We call this digital distortion or clipping. And as audio engineers, we strive to keep the audio signal well below this threshold and give enough headroom, so to speak. The next property we can talk about is the cycle. A cycle is a section of the waveform stretching from when the signal starts to when it reaches back to its initial value. It's the same as the section between two consecutive peaks, which are the high points of the wave, or the section between two consecutive valleys or troughs, which are the low points. But it's all the same, just different ways of looking at it. A lot of interesting properties are associated with a cycle of the waveform, like the wavelength, which is represented by the Greek alphabet lambda, which is a measure of the length of the cycle, usually measured in meters. Just by looking at the sine graph, the wavelength is not directly visible. But what is measurable is the time taken to finish a full cycle, which is called the time period, or just the period, and denoted as t. Here, each cycle takes 0.1 second to complete, which is a small number, but in the real world, values of time periods are much smaller than this. So another way of looking at it is the frequency. Instead of asking how much time it takes for a cycle to complete, we can instead ask how many cycles are completed in one second. The answer to this is just the reciprocal of the time period. In this case, it's 10. 10 cycles are repeated every second. Or its frequency is 10 Hertz, which is the standard unit of measure for frequency, named after Heinrich Hertz. So this is what a 10 Hertz wave sounds like. Listen closely. Did you hear it? Whales probably did, but not humans. Our ears aren't tuned to pick up frequencies that low. So let's boost it up a little, by a factor of 10. This is 100 Hz, all the way up to 400 Hz. Our ears can pick up frequencies in the range of 20 Hz to 20,000 or 20 kilohertz. But the boundaries are quite fuzzy, and dependent on person to person and on age and a lot of other factors. What you just heard is a change in pitch. Pitch is a particularly hard term to define, and I'll try to do it along with loudness in another module. But generally speaking, it's a perceptual property of audio, given meaning and recognition by our brain to differentiate between different frequencies. Higher the frequency, higher the perception of pitch. How do we represent pitch in our equation then? It's simple. We just add a multiplication factor of frequency inside the sine function. For the same duration of time, we have f multiples of the sine wave. Great. As a bonus, we can talk about wavelength, although we never use it in the perspective of audio, but it's good to have in your scientific tool belt. Recalling elementary physics of one-dimensional motion, the speed of a body is given by the distance it covers over the time taken to cover it. Let's apply it to the realm of audio and consider the sound wave as a body. The time taken for a single cycle t is 0.01 seconds 
and the speed of sound in air is well established to be 343 meters per second. So we get the wavelength of a 100 hertz wave to be approximately 3.4 meters, just to give you a perspective. And then we have the final property that I'd like to discuss, which is phase. In the previous video, I mentioned that the sine and cosine waves are quite similar to each other, except for the fact that they were offset from each other. How do we quantify this? We can see that if we let the sine wave play out its natural course of action, at pi over 2 radian, we arrive at the position where the cos wave would have started. We can say that the sine wave is trailing behind the cos wave by pi over 2 radian. In other words, the phase offset of the cos wave is positive pi over 2 radian, since the phase is usually measured with respect to the starting point of the sine wave. Push the wave back by pi radian, and we can say that this wave has a phase offset of negative pi radian. We represent this shift by adding a phase value into our sinusoidal equation. The phase is represented by the Greek letter phi, and is measured in radians. Let's see what the real world effects are. Here's a sine wave with a frequency of 400 hertz played back. Now, here's the exact same wave with a phase offset of positive pi over 2 radian. Now here's one with a phase offset of negative pi radian. Did you notice the difference? Well, there isn't one. Phase is a difficult concept to wrap your mind around. On their own, these waveforms sound absolutely the same. Phase only comes into effect when two or more waves interact with each other. Here's a playback of two sine waves, exactly the same, with the same amplitude, frequency, and phase. While you can hear that the combined wave complement each other, and the volume generally increases. The waves are said to be constructively interfering with each other. Now let's change the phase offset of one of the waves to be close to pi radian, but not exactly pi radian. We hear a significant reduction in volume, and the waves are said to be destructively interfering with each other. When the phase offset is exactly pi radian, there's a total cancellation of the wave. Phase issues are hard to spot for a sound engineer, especially when recording the same source with two or more mics, which are positioned at slightly different distances from the source. Examples can be multi-track drum recordings, stereo acoustic guitar recordings, where the problems wouldn't be noticeable if they're separated in their own stereo space, but it can bite you if they're mixed together into a mono track. We'll definitely be looking at the science behind phasing and how waves interact with each other in another module. But we'll also be looking at the programming aspects of phase, where you can take advantage of this property of interference and control it to get creative sounds through phasing. So just to recap the properties of the sinusoid, we have the amplitude A, which controls the volume and the loudness of the signal. We have three properties, namely frequency, time period, and wavelength, which can be interchangeably used, which controls the pitch of the audio signal. We all use frequency because it makes the most contextual sense. And we have the phase phi, which controls how different sinusoids interact with each other. If you're itching to create your own custom waveform based on the equation, head on over to the link in the description below, where I've plugged in the wave equation and created sliders for all the properties that you can change. And you can play around to see how the wave equation behaves for different inputs. And you can even mess with the equation itself to see what effects it has. Here's another resource you can have endless fun with a sine wave generator, which is also provided in the link below. You can play the sine waves at different frequencies, you can change the general shape of your waveform, you can make R2D2 sounds if that's your thing, and you can also test your threshold of hearing to see where yours lie. I can just about make out sounds at about 18 and a half thousand hertz, and no more than that. But be careful with this one, and keep the volume low, cause it will freak your dog out. In the next video, which is the final video in the module on the origins of the sine wave, we'll look at sinusoids more holistically. We'll try to decouple our understanding of sinusoids based on the mathematics of triangles and rotating unit circles, which is pure applied mathematics, and talk instead about why sinusoidal motion is so ingrained in nature, and what causes these waves to exist in the first place.